it'll give me a, a little bit of time to introduce you because your bio is quite incredible. Uh, so, hello everyone, and thank you for being with us today for our second webinar of the year, which is part of our Changing Face of Cancer webinar series. My name is Kathy Bernard, and I am the founder and the president of the Save Your Skin Foundation, and also a stage 4 melanoma survivor. In today's webinar, we will be taking a closer look at the current treatments in Canada for melanoma and what patients need to know about them. The webinar is really to help educate patients on the current landscape of melanoma treatments in Canada, as well as what the horizon of treatment options is looking like, and also which clinical trials are currently underway in Quebec. I am honoured to introduce Dr. Wilson Miller, our presenter for today's webinar. Dr. Miller's positions include uh, the Director of Laboratory Research, Division of Hematology Oncology, Department of Medicine, Sir Mortimer B. Davis, Jewish General Hospital, Professor, Departments of Medicine and Oncology at McGill University, Director, Clinical Research Unit, Sir Mortimer B. Davis, Jewish General Hospital, Co-Director, Clinical Research Program, Department of Oncology, McGill University, Director, Development Therapeutics Program, Department of Oncology at McGill University, Scientific Member, McGill Centre for Translation Research in Canada, or in Cancer, I'm sorry. Uh, I'd also recommend that you check out his bio, uh, Google his bio, because I could spend the first 15 minutes of uh, this webinar introducing him, but I'd rather we hear from uh, Dr. Miller himself. So Dr. Wilson Miller, I will now let you take over the floor, and thank you very much. Thank you, Kathy, for that slightly overly generous reading of too many jobs. Uh, so, uh, are the slides up now? Yes, they are. Okay. So, I'm going to talk about uh, two kinds of exciting new therapies, uh, both of which were pioneered in melanoma, and both of which have led to dramatic improvements in response rate, survival outcome, and you know, in general, have made melanoma go from a pretty hopeless cancer once it had spread to one where we have a lot of options and some of the options offer, you know, real promise. So I'm going to show some, you know, real data slides that physicians hand around. And I know there are some people in the audience who do have a medical background or a scientific background and some who don't. So I'll try to explain them for those who don't. And uh, is there a mechanism to ask questions uh, in the middle, Kathy? Uh, Dr. Miller, we'll let you present and then we'll have people uh, chat in their questions at the end of the presentation. Okay, because I just don't want anybody to get lost. Uh, you know, if you get lost, you know, hit the panic button or something and maybe they'll notice and they can tell me to slow down. <laughs> Perfect. So the first slide is pretty easy. Uh, the first slide is just uh, illustrating the problem, which, uh, which is that over the past uh, close to a century, uh, the incidence of melanoma has gone up and up and up. And some of this is from better diagnosis but a lot of it is from a real increase in the disease, either related to uh, the sun tanning craze that started uh, sometime in the middle of the last century, or depletion of the ozone layer, or factors unknown. Uh, but the bottom line is it is still increasing. So the next graph, and this is one of a lot of graphs called a survival curve that I'm going to show, and this is the bad news survival curve for melanoma. This is a historic uh, curve uh, basically over decades of clinical trials in melanoma trying to make a better treatment. Uh, this is from 42 different clinical trials of the the latest idea of what's going to improve the treatment of advanced melanoma, uh, stage four meaning advanced melanoma that has you know, spread from the local area. Uh, and what you see is on the bottom across the x-axis, across the, the horizontal line, is the time from diagnosis. And on the right side, going up the uh, axis, is the proportion of patients who are still alive. So this is your basic survival curve, 
And what it shows, if you notice the black uh, vertical bar at six months, is the median survival of 6.2 months, which means half the patients who have advanced melanoma die within 6.2 months. And this has been this is an average over, as I said, a couple decades of clinical trials. And in order to be in a clinical trial, as many of you may know, uh, you have to be somewhat better off than a lot of patients. So this is, if anything, an optimistic view of the real chances for a melanoma patient who had advanced disease over decades. Uh, as you can see, it goes down from there. At one year, the survival rate is 25%, and it keeps going down. So that's the bad news, and I'm going to show you a lot of curves that compare very favorably with this, so keep that sort of in mind. Uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit of science, and without getting uh, too uh, involved in the three and sometimes four-letter words for different oncogenes, which are genes that can drive cancer, uh, I'll just point out that the key oncogene in melanoma, which is active in most melanomas probably, but is particularly active and drives the disease in melanomas where the gene itself is mutated, and that's the gene called BRAF. And so, you know, years ago in a study of all the patients they could find, uh, close to 700 here, they found that 47% had some mutation in this gene and were therefore, based on other research, uh, had a disease that was really driven uh, by this mutation. Uh, they also found that the mutation, if it occurred in one part of the, the, your body where you had tumor in other parts, in other metastases, in the primary lesion, it would be there too. So it's, you know, you either have it or you don't, and it's important to know for the reasons that I will show you in the next slide. So this is a primary data slide from really one of the most exciting publications ever in melanoma, and this is all in patients who have the BRAF mutation and who have advanced melanoma. And this is the response rate and the you know, progression-free survival rate, and I'll go into more detail what these words mean, uh, for patients treated with this new drug that was designed specifically to target the mutated BRAF that drives melanoma. So this is a drug that's tailored towards this particular molecular pattern of tumor and really not much else. Uh, DTIC is the label for a standard chemotherapy that was the best we had for 20, 30 years for melanoma and maybe is better than nothing, although that was never formally proven. Uh, but the comparison I think you'll see is quite impressive. Uh, on the left-hand side, we show you a graph that's called a waterfall plot because it kind of looks like a waterfall. And what you see is bars that go above the zero line and they're just two or three maybe four or five of them, if you can see the dark blue kind of blends in with the background, but there are they're like four or five patients who actually had tumor progression right from the beginning and didn't respond at all to the drug. And then all the others on the most of that graph uh, going across the line that says patients treated with imorapinib, uh, the bar showed you the percent decrease in their tumor that the drug was able to achieve. Some of them went all the way to 100% decrease, uh, but almost all of the patients treated had some level of decrease. So that's pretty good. Uh, and that is confirmed by the second graph, uh, which is now, remember I showed you a survival curve, so this is a progression-free survival curve. This is how long in months did the patient go on the drug before the tumor progressed. So the blue line, which is way to the right of the gray line, is vimorafenib, and the gray line is chemo. The carbazine is another word for DTIC. Uh, so as you can see, big gap. Did much better with vimorafenib. That's the good news. The bad news is you don't have to go out that many months to see the patients progress on vimorafenib as well. So, you know, at two months to four months, most patients are doing great on vimorafenib, but then by eight months, most of them are going to have a relapse. Uh, so, how does that translate 
uh, into an actual example. So in this slide, I show the same patient who has pictures taken of his melanoma, in this case metastatic, especially to the skin, uh, which melanoma sometimes does. And uh, on the left, you see baseline, uh, front and back pictures of this poor guy who has skin lesions from melanoma all over the place. He was started on vimurafenib, and 15 weeks, weeks later, you see the middle pictures, which pretty much show all the disease is gone. And that's great, wonderful, everybody's excited. And then, unfortunately, at 23 weeks, uh, he has bad disease that's back, and you know he's got a band-aid because one of his lesions is so big it's broken down and oozing, and really the patient didn't do well at that point. So this is kind of the good and bad of BRAF therapy. It works really fast. It works really in almost everybody, but there are recurrences. And I'm going to contrast that to immunotherapy, which is different uh, in a few slides. So this is a complicated slide, uh, but really all it's meant to say is in the top half, which is called monotherapy studies, uh, three different inhibitors of the RAF pathway, uh, vimorafenib we've talked about, dabrafenib, which is now more commonly used in Canada, and trametinib, which is a, an inhibitor of a related oncogene that's in the same pathway, so it works sort of the same. If you go all the way to the right column that is gray, ORR means objective response rate. So that's how many patients had shrinkage beyond a certain cutoff that is a fairly strict cutoff. So you have to have a, a good amount of tumor shrinkage to be called a response. And the answer is with uh, either dabrafenib or vimorafenib, over 50% had official responses, and with DTIC, you know, it's all single digit. Uh, and then if you go down to the second half, combination studies, uh, this is the two drugs are better than one, and we have now moved to giving two different inhibitors of the same pathway. One of them is the RAF inhibitor, either dabrafenib or, or, uh, or vimurafenib. And the second is the MEK inhibitor, which is right in the same pathway. I'm not going to go over the oncogenic pathways with you unless somebody has questions. Uh, and there you see a higher response rate uh, versus the single agent, which has pretty much the same response rate you saw in the monotherapy study. So, one drug, vimurafenib or dabrafenib, big advance over chemotherapy, but you lose the response pretty fast. Add a second targeted agent, pretty good advance over that, and if you want to go to one column before the end, the one called OS is overall survival. You see in the top group the overall survival was better with the one drug than with chemo, and then in the second group, the numbers go up even higher for overall survival with two drugs with the same kind of numbers for uh, one drug. Um, so to put it in another way, uh, this is a study done by uh, a group led by Georgina Long from Australia, and they looked at three different large trials of dibrafenib, trametinib versus single agent versus other things, and they just looked at the survival data for the patients who got the combination. And this is the combination that's most commonly used in Canada now. And as you can see, one year, two year survival are pretty good, uh, much, much better than the one year survival of 25%, which would have been a third of this, or the two year survival, which is even worse uh, for chemo alone. Uh, but you know, the numbers still drift down, and by three or four years, it, it, notably less than 50% are still doing okay. So it's great, but it's not great enough. And the median survival up uh, in the other uh, side of the graph there is 25.6 months, so a little over two years, consistent with the fact that the graph itself says 53% survived two years. Just to look ahead a little bit to immune therapy, if you go down to the bottom of the graph, you'll see the word Pembro, which is for Pembrolizumab, and we'll talk about that drug. And it does about the same as maybe a little bit worse, but pretty close. 
to this combination, uh, dibrafenib trametinib. And then the very, very early data from a combination immune therapy regimen, which I'll talk about. It's both very effective and very toxic, uh, but the numbers are incredible, 85% and 79% at two years. So I'll come back to the differences between immunotherapy and uh, targeted therapy uh, briefly. Uh, this slide is a little complicated, but is a very important slide for deciding who should get what drug uh, or what type of drug. Uh, these are baseline factors, again, in that same group of 600 patients that Dr. Long studied, uh, that influence the long-term survival. And I'm just going to highlight the two extremes. Uh, if you take uh, the blood test, LDH, which is a simple blood test we get in all our patients with melanoma, with advanced melanoma, and it is often a measure of how much disease you have. If the LDH is higher than normal, that's a bad prognostic factor. And if it's two times higher than normal, that's the purple circle on the far right of the slide. And uh, if you see the yellow um, line is around the three-year, five-year survival, which is 7%. In fact, if you look up, the two-year, five-year survival is 7%. So that's really bad. And even with the LDH just a little bit above upper normal, the blue uh, oval just to the left, three-year survival is 9%. In contrast, on the red bar, on the red circle on the other side of the graph, two- and three-year survival are both above 70%. And these are patients who have a normal LDH and not too many different sites of disease. So if, you know, so the amount of disease you have measured both by biochemistry, the LDH, and by just looking at the scans and seeing how, how many different organs are involved uh, is really important for determining the long-term survival for this treatment. Uh, so let's move on now to the next exciting area of therapy for melanoma. And I don't know if it's possible technically, Kathy, but can we see if there are any questions on the first part just now? There can. Um, if anybody has any questions they want me to put to Dr. Uh, Miller, you can just go into the little chat box and uh, type in um, your question, and I'll just answer, or I'll just uh, send it over to Dr. Miller. No questions yet, Dr. Miller? So either that means everybody understands really well, or everybody's totally lost. Hopefully the really well. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, good. So uh, the next slide, uh, let me just minimize this box here. Uh, is a cartoon showing a T-cell. The T-cell is the effector cell of the immune response, both against a lot of foreign insults, viruses, other problems, and cancer. And so when we talk about immune surveillance and immune attack of cancer, this is all mediated by T-cells, which are immune cells. They are they learn what cancers to attack or what viruses to attack or what to attack uh, in the immune organs, and then they move to the periphery where the cancers are to kill the cancer cells, in theory, if everything is working. Uh, they're also a finely regulated system because you don't want the immune system to get out of control. Sometimes the immune system attacks your own cells, and that's bad. So they have a lot of stimulatory and inhibitory signals. And these signals are all mediated by receptors, which are proteins on the surface of the T cell. And this cartoon just shows you uh, a sampling of six inhibitory and six activating receptors. So if you uh, turn on the receptors that are in blue, uh, that makes the T cell turn on, and if you activate the receptors on the other side that are kind of red to green, uh, that makes the T cell turn off. And different receptors work at different points in the life cycle of the T cell, and I'll just talk a very little bit about that with respect to the two first targets of immune oncology, which are just the two 
top inhibitory receptors, CTLA-4 and PD-1. So the next slide goes into more detail about that and maybe a little too much detail, but I'll try to walk you through it. Uh, if you go up to where it says priming phase, uh, you have a dendritic cell, which is an antigen presenting cell. It takes pieces of a virus or a cell that shouldn't be there or a tumor cell, chops them up and then presents it to the T cell. And the T cell can learn from that uh, that this is something that we don't want to have, and then the T cell uh, replicates, uh, becomes many T cells, all of whom are looking for this particular uh, signal, uh, this particular piece of the target called an antigen, and they go to wherever the target is. In the case of cancer, they go to the tumor microenvironment, whether it's in a metastasis or in the primary site or wherever, uh, and they try to kill the tumor. So in the priming phase, as I said before, they're activating signals, and if you go down to number A, CD28 is an activating signal. There are also sometimes inhibitory signals, and CTLA-4 can turn off the process. And so if the cancers find a way to focus CTLA-4 and get CTLA-4 activated, then they're not going to be, a, they're not going to be T cells grown in the body to attack them. So that's one area of a, of a break to the immune system, which we can turn off, uh, we can block the break with an antibody shown in the slide. And the antibody that was first discovered for this and is still fairly widely in use is called ipilimumab, also known as Urvoy, and I'll show you some of the clinical data on that. If the cells are made and targeted to the tumor and grown and moved to the periphery, then they bind the cancer cell and they try to kill it. But here also there's a regulatory receptor called PD-1. Uh, and if the tumor can activate PD-1 by binding the protein that turns it on, which is called the ligand, uh, here it's called PD-L1 for PD-1 ligand, uh, then they don't kill the cancer cell, they get turned off and actually get senescent and go away. Uh, so here we can block either the receptor or the ligand with an antibody, so that's either an antibody to PD-1 or an antibody to PD-L1, and in theory overcome this mechanism of resistance and kill the tumor cells. And both of these approaches work, and I'll show you data for both of them. So the first drug, uh, ipilimumab, also known as Urvoy. Um, there were a bunch of studies, and I'm not going to show you all the early studies. I'm just going to show you the pooled analysis from all the studies and then from all the studies plus an expanded access program that basically gave it to 3,000 patients across the United States who their physicians believed might benefit. So this was a very broad group of patients, some of whom didn't have a lot of disease, some of whom were almost dead, and they tried it in everybody. And what they found very consistently, both in the clinical trial patients and really the same result when you add in the expanded access patients, was not that many people had a great response. People dropped off the curve pretty fast. Uh, one year and two year, although you'll see the two year survival here is 25%. That's the same as the one year survival uh, in previous uh, studies with chemotherapy. The 12 year survival is closer to 50%, so they uh, doubled the um, survival from chemotherapy. Uh, but what's really exciting is after a couple of years, the curve gets flat, which means going out to as far as 10 years. Uh, patients who have responded to ipilimumab, the lucky ones who do respond, stay in response. So this is really the excitement of this is the first time ever in melanoma and one of the few times in any solid tumor, any cancer, uh, where a drug worked on metastatic disease and when it did work, it tended to work for as long as you could go out and look. Um, I can't say for sure that these patients who are eight and nine years out are cured, but you know, at least you can use that word. Whereas years ago, we just that the C word was not something we talked about in metastatic cancer. 
So the next thing that came along are the PD-1 inhibitors. And this is an example of one of the PD-1 inhibitors called pembrolizumab or Keytruda, abbreviated Pembro here. And this is the same survival curve. Uh, this is percent alive and this is time and months on the, on the x-axis. And here with IPI in purple, which is clearly the lowest bar, which means the losing drug, and two different schedules of Pembro in blue and in yellow, and you can see, especially as time goes out, they overlap. Uh, and so you can see you go from a 60% one-year survival in this study to a 70% plus with Pembro, and at two years, the difference is even more striking, 43% versus 55%. And it's looking like the curves are maybe starting to starting to straighten out, although 24 months is a lot fewer than 100 months, which I showed you on the, uh, the long-term IPI curve. So we don't really know the shape of this curve out to five years yet, and that's something that we're, we're all eager uh, to see the latest results at every meeting. And it is updated uh, fairly frequently, the companies looking very closely to give us updated data whenever they can. So the third possibility for immunotherapy, uh, just as with targeted therapy, I told you uh, two drugs is better than one. Uh, with immunotherapy, they decided to try both the CTLA-4 target and the PD-1 targeting agents, i.e. ipilimumab, which is CTLA-4, and nivolumab, which is the BMS version, the Bristol-Myers version of pembrolizumab. Uh, they're from different companies. They have a slightly different timing of administration, but other than that, they work the same as far as we know. And when you combine IPRI and NEVO, then in an early study, and I'll stress it's an early study, you had an amazing result of 85% alive at one year and two-thirds alive at three years. Uh, that was an early study, it was a small study, and they were highly selected patients because they were afraid the drug would be the drugs would be toxic, which they were. I'll show you that data in a minute. Uh, so you can't predict this is going to be the case for everybody, but at least it was sufficiently exciting to, for people to take notice. So what happens when people take notice? They do a bigger trial and they do a comparison trial. So this is the randomized, double-blind, phase three study comparing the combination IPI-NEVO with NEVO alone, and again to IPI alone just to confirm that the PD-1 inhibitor alone is or is not better than IPI alone. And this is a big trial, very carefully done, 300 patients in each group. Uh, this, I think, will be the definitive trial uh, for these comparisons, uh, but we don't have all the data we would like yet. What data do we have? We have response rates. ORR, as I mentioned before, and with IPI, it's low as usual. Those 19% tend to do really well, but it's only 19%. Uh, with NEVO, it's more than twice that. And with IPI plus NEVO, it's even a bit higher. Is this statistically higher than this? They didn't do that test. I'm not sure it is. Uh, but at least they're both statistically higher than IPI. So here is a progression-free survival curve, and this again has months going out on the horizontal x-axis, and percent of patients who have not had progression of their disease on the y-axis. So they all start out at 100%, and they start to drop off at three months. Why three months? That's when they did the first CAT scan to look for progression. And as you can see, the green, which is IPI, drops off a whole lot more than the blue, which is NEVO, which drops off more than the orange, which is IPI plus NEVO. But as you go out further, and there are not a lot of patients out here, the number of patients at each time point is shown down below the, the months in the fine print, and they drop off fast after 12 months. But even at 12 months, the two... Uh, red and blue curves, the NEVO alone versus IPI plus NEVO, aren't looking all that different. And so uh, this is a recurring question that we don't have an answer for, is just how much better is the combination versus NEVO alone? 
Uh, another way of sh asking that question is look at the so-called waterfall plots. And here, the ones below the line are the ones who have a response, and the ones above the line don't. And you can see there are more patients above the line with NEVO alone than there are with IPNEVO. I don't show here the IPI alone curve, but it would even be more above the line and less below the line. So just to make life more complicated, there are these things that we look for in all cancers called predictive biomarkers. And a predictive biomarker is some kind of marker of the tumor. It can be a blood test. It can be a genetic test. It can be a immunologic test on the slides from the pathology department uh, that is going to predict whether the patient will actually uh, respond to a drug or not. And we've already kind of had one of those, which is the BRAF mutation. I didn't show you data, but if you give vimorafenib to a melanoma patient who does not have a BRAF mutation, it's bad. If anything, it makes the disease grow faster. It absolutely doesn't help, which is why you absolutely need to have the BRAF testing done before you can make a decision on whether to give targeted therapy to a melanoma patient. So it's very important to get that done as soon as you can. Uh, in this case, for immunotherapy, it's not a gene mutation we look at. It's actually the expression of a protein in the pathology slides. And so here they look for this protein called PDL1, and they divided the patients into those where the PDL1 was strongly positive. And strongly positive in this case means greater than 5%. Some people might not call that strong, but in this setting it's pretty good, uh, versus less than 5%. And here you see where PDL1 is positive, the IPINEVO and the NEVO curves are pretty much identical. And so that suggests that maybe if you have PDL1 expression, NEVO alone is just as good as IPI. Uh, what about when you don't have PDL1 expression? Well, there the curves are pretty separated. And this separation is a bit more than we saw in the slide before with all comers. And you can see the progression-free survival here, the median PFS, is 11 versus 5. So that's a big difference. And IPI is still worse at 2.8. Uh, whereas here, with pdl one expression, progression-free survival, 14 versus 14. Not a bit different. There are still some differences in the subgroups. The pdl one positive patients uh, have a higher response rate for IPI-NEVO than they do for NEVO, much higher than IPI. Uh, and the pdl one negative patients have a higher response for the combo than for NEVO, again, higher than IPI. So not everything shows IPI-NEVO and NEVO to be the same in pdl one expressing cells, but there's some data that this may be important. And the next slide shows the reason why it's important. Uh, this is the safety summary. And if you focus just on the bold numbers, uh, IPI alone shows 27% uh, of patients had significant adverse events. That's uh, grade three to four. You grade adverse events. One is almost nothing. Two is annoying, but you can control it without usually stopping the drug. And three and four is bad. Uh, and as you see, IPI alone has a fair number of these. And 13% of them led to, were bad enough that they had to stop the therapy. Uh, but deaths are very rare. Uh, NEVO, smaller number. One in 20 have to stop the therapy uh, at some point because of uh, nivolumab toxicity, so really not very bad at all. Uh, IPI-NEVO, in contrast, 55% had a bad toxicity, and 30% had to stop. Uh, much higher numbers, much more toxic, and you know there's more data that shows in many ways how much more toxic it is. And we're slowly learning how to deal with the toxicity, but it is a real problem. Uh, there is one bit of good news that's at the bottom of the slide, that patients who do get a really bad reaction to ipinevo and have to stop, uh, nevertheless, do well clinically. Uh, the bad reaction that is autoimmune, targeting your own tissues, is, a bad is accompanied usually by bad damage to the tumor which is, of course, a good thing. So 
two-thirds of the patients who had bad toxicity to Abinevo developed a really good response. And these responses tended to be durable. I don't think I put it in that slide, but the response duration for patients who had to stop before they got the full regimen is even better than the response duration for patients who responded after getting the full regimen. So, you know, toxicity is not necessarily a bad thing once you get through it. So this leaves us with some questions. Uh, the first question is which approved targeted therapy to give to BRAF mutation, mutated patients. I showed you two was better than one. I showed you two different combinations of two, uh, one of, both of which are now available in Canada. Uh, and I'll get back to which one to give a little bit later and maybe we can address that in the question period if there are questions. Uh, which immunotherapy is best uh, is uh, another pending question. As I discussed, we think immunotherapy with two agents is more effective than one, but it may depend on PDL1 status and it may depend on survival data, which I didn't show you. I didn't show you survival curves for that study. That's really what we want to know. Uh, in the long run, are more patients going to, are substantially more patients going to be alive with combined therapy in spite of cost and toxicity and also possible financial costs that we can talk about uh, at some point because financial costs are very important to the governments that have to pay for these drugs. Uh, if one immunotherapy fails, can another still work? I didn't show you any slides of that, but the answer is yes. Uh, the answer is the PD-1 inhibitors, both pembrolizumab and nivolumab, were developed mostly in failure, patients who'd failed ipilimumab, and so they do work in that setting. They also work in patients who haven't had ipilimumab. And we're now getting more and more data that uh, now that we use the PD-1 inhibitors first, that ipilimumab can still work when the PD-1 inhibitors fail. Uh, and I'll get back to that question. BRAF mutated patients, the hardest thing to answer is, so what do you choose? Do you choose immunotherapy or do you choose targeted therapy? You got too many choices. Which do you choose? And can you give them both? Can you give them in sequence? Can you give them together? Uh, all these questions are being asked in clinical trials and all these questions are very important to the payers who again would prefer not to pay for both. Uh, which leads to the final question is how can we pay for all these ridiculously overpriced drugs? And they are really overpriced. The prices of new cancer drugs have just shot up dramatically over the last decade with no really good explanation for why they had to go up so much, at least in my opinion. Uh, any senior pharmaceutical executives here who want to explain that, uh, we would, we have a question period. Uh, so, just to have a summary that compares the different treatments, uh, here we have uh, mechanism delivery, kinetics, response, effect on survival problems. Here we have the three different possible immunotherapies, ipilone, nivolone, the combination nivolone here, you could substitute pembrolizumab alone or probably other PD-1 inhibitors that haven't been as extensively tested in melanoma and in the targeted combo, either of the two targeted combos that are available in uh, Canada uh, fit this, uh, this description. So mechanisms, as we've discussed, uh, different immune targeting, targeting uh, the two oncogenes that drive BRAF mutated melanoma, uh, method of delivery, all the immune therapies are antibodies which have to be given by infusion, and the targeted therapies are, are to date all pills. Uh, kinetics of response, uh, really fast for targeted therapy, as I showed you. Uh, pretty fast for the ipinevo combination, but traditionally delayed for the first immunotherapies, especially ipilimumab, but pretty slow as well for many patients uh, on a PD-1 inhibitor. So if you want speed, the targeted combo is the best, and ipinevo may be competitive. Uh, response rate, here it just goes up steadily. Uh, IPI alone, not so much. Uh, PD-1 alone, better. PD-1 plus IPI, notably better still. 
but still probably the best in terms of response percentage is the targeted combo. Uh, however, effect on survival, although it's significant with IPI and significant with NEVO, it may be really significant with the combination, but the data is not mature. And it's pretty significant for targeted combos, but as I showed you, it may depend on the clinical features, uh, whether the survival is really good or really, at two and three years, not good at all. So problems, you can infer from what I already said. It be the problem is a low response rate, less than a quarter. Uh, nivolumab, also pembrolizumab, uncertain long-term survival. Uh, we don't know if it's going to have a flat curve, which is what I showed you for ipilimumab. Uh, ipinevo, the big problem is toxicity. We also don't have survival data, but uh, the toxicity data we have, and it's difficult to manage. Uh, the targeted pills, the combination, the problem, as I showed you, is resistance. <clears throat> almost everybody responds, at least to an extent for a while, but then almost everybody relapses, and it can be difficult to treat. So for an individual patient, I think you need an individual discussion. Uh, in general, uh, what I do is give the targeted combination, well, in general, I try to put patients on clinical research protocols, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. But outside of that, I think targeted combos work fast, which is good for a certain subset of patients. But the only patients they work for a long time in are actually patients who have less disease, less aggressively, rapidly growing disease, and uh, those were initially the patients who we thought we would give immunotherapy because immunotherapy takes time and therefore we thought, well, take the patients who have time, i.e. the ones who don't have a lot of disease, and the patients who have a lot of disease, they need a fast response, give them targeted therapy. But now the survival data from targeted therapy suggests that might be the wrong order. So you will sense some confusion in the community as to which we should get first and you know at every conference there are a couple of debates on which should be given first. Um, I would say right now across Canada uh, Ipinevo was popular where we could get it and in Quebec we can't get it in uh, Ontario and Alberta some people can get it through insurance but it's not approved yet by the governments and you know we're waiting for more data and for approvals. In the U.S., it is available, and there people really do have the the you know the the four choices, mostly now three choices. People don't mostly give it be first line anymore, so it's either PD-1 alone, combo, uh, or the targeted pill combo. So, what's new? What trials do we have going on? We have a lot of trials. You know, the development of treatment for advanced melanoma has been so fast and so exciting that everybody now wants to get into the game with every possible combination of immunologic agents and a few combinations of new targeted agents and a lot of combinations of targeted agents plus immunotherapy agents. And I'm not going to go through all these in detail because there's a bunch of names of a bunch of drugs and receptors, uh, but we have active trials going on across Canada and in Montreal and a lot actually here at the Jewish of combinations of immunotherapy. Uh, we participated in some of the combination trials here at the top and we now have ongoing a combination of a new uh, genetically engineered tumor vaccine uh, that has good activity on its own and is thought to have better activity when you combine it with a standard immunotherapy agent, uh, this being pembrolizumab. Uh, we have other novel drugs compared with three different uh, PD-1 or PD-L1 inhibitors, atezolizumab, nevolizumab, nivolumab. We have new PD-1 inhibitors with new drugs. We have adjuvant trials, which means after your initial surgery, if there's a high risk of ultimate recurrence, treat now and hope to cure the patient and prevent the ultimate uh, recurrence. On the other side of the graph, uh, immunotherapy plus targeted therapy, uh, dibrafenib, trametinib is what's mostly used in Canada and what we mostly have in clinical trials, and we have 
this trial ongoing of Dabtrim plus pembrolizumab. Uh, a new trial that will start soon is going to replace pembrolizumab with a different PD-1 inhibitor. Uh, I'm not sure that's going to change the efficacy, but it'll give us the opportunity to enroll for one year in this and then enroll for the next year in that, which is great. Uh, we also have new combinations of different immune therapies and different uh, targeted therapies together. I'll just show you one slide, I think, of a combination. Uh, remember I told you ipilimumab alone had a 20% response rate. Uh, that means not so many people on this side. But when you add TVEC, the genetically engineered tumor vaccine to ipilimumab, now all of a sudden you got a lot more people on the response side, including a bunch of people with 100% response, which is rare with ipilimumab alone, and not that many people who are primarily resistant. Uh, another way of looking at it is in the table here. 50% objective response of whom a third of the patient total had a complete response. That's an amazing number for uh, immune therapy. And a bunch more had partial responses, and a bunch more had very stable disease. Only a, a bit more than a quarter of the patients actually progressed initially. So very exciting combo. Uh, the combo we're doing now is actually TVAC plus a PD-1 inhibitor, uh, which is thought now to be even more exciting just because the PD-1 inhibitors are thought to be better drugs than the CTLA-4 inhibitors. Uh, that trial is now ongoing at our place. Uh, and a bunch of other trials I, I won't really talk about because they change all the time. Um, so back to our big questions. And this is almost the final slide, so uh, have your questions ready. Uh, which approved targeted therapy can we give BRAF mutated? Patients. Right now, we have two. We have the brafinib trametinib, which is uh, from Novartis and is paid for, I think, pretty much across Canada. Uh, certainly, it's available in Quebec. Uh, we have the Roche drugs, vimurafenib uh, plus cobimetinib, and those are right now available on access programs through uh, Roche, but obviously, they're hoping to have them marketed and sold uh, throughout Canada. And there's one more combination that is probably coming that may actually be in some ways better than the first two combinations, but it's not approved anywhere yet. It just had one large randomized study showing that it was good. Uh, so we'll, you know, that'll have to be the topic of a future uh, conference. Which immune therapy is best? Uh, we really have... Uh, no clear proof yet. We have good evidence that PD-1 targeting is better than IPI, and we have good evidence that IPI-NEVO gives you more responses with a lot more toxicity, and the long-term survival benefit and the cost benefit, either in terms of toxicity or in terms of dollars, is not known. Uh, so, uh, But we're, we've done the studies, and we will get that information soon. Uh, if one immunotherapy fails, can another still work? Well, I told you the data, which is yes, uh, but it is fairly preliminary still for IPI after PD-1. And for reasons I don't fully understand, and there have been a lot of letters written by Canadian oncologists to the health authorities on this subject, uh, all the provinces but Quebec, oddly, uh, have now refused to give two different immunotherapies and will not let you give ipilimumab after failure of a PD-1. You can choose whichever immunotherapy you want to give, but you're stuck with the one you choose and you're not allowed to give another one. Uh, scientifically, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Financially, I guess, to the provinces it did. Uh, and as I said, for whatever reason, maybe they haven't gotten around to it yet or maybe they're more enlightened in this case, uh, Quebec actually does allow you to give either drug, after either drug, you can give both, you can give them in any order. That's really a good thing uh, right now in Quebec. BRAF mutated patients, how do you choose immunotherapy versus targeted therapy? The data is not all in. We're waiting for it. There's a lot of studies addressing that specific question. And right now, one of the reasons you have a choice made for you is local funding rules. Uh, once again, Quebec is pretty good. Quebec will allow you to give targeted therapy and immunotherapy 
if targeted therapy fails or immunotherapy first and then targeted therapy if immunotherapy fails. But some of the provinces actually dictate the order. I believe it is you have to give the RAF inhibitors first and only if they fail can you give immuno. And if you give immuno, then you cannot give the RAF inhibitors. Makes no sense, no scientific justification, but that's what some provinces are doing. Uh, and the reason they're doing that is society really is going to have trouble paying for all these overpriced drugs. Uh, melanoma is a fairly rare disease. Maybe we could afford it in melanoma, but the immune therapy drugs work well in lung cancer. And lung cancer is not a rare disease, as I'm sure you guys know. So how are we going to pay for all these drugs in all the cancers where they work? They also work in kidney cancer. They work in Hodgkin's lymphoma. They work in a bunch of things, which is exciting and it's great if you're an oncologist and it's great if you're a patient who has a drug that can put you in a deep, durable remission where otherwise you had nothing. Uh, but it's not so good if you're uh, in charge of a budget that's going bankrupt because the drugs are taking too much money. So. What do we do about that? Uh, my personal approach is try to put everybody on a clinical trial because a clinical trial, they give the latest drugs, the best drugs, the newest drugs, all for free. And sometimes they're in novel combinations where one of them is the drug you would have bought anyway. And sometimes they're in comparison to other treatments and usually they pay for both, although sometimes the trials try to get you to pay for the control arm quote. Um, and so, I think clinical, clinical trials are great, and I recommend everybody go somewhere where they can get access to clinical trials if they have metastatic melanoma, because that's still the, you know, the best treatment. You know, for the last 10 years, people on clinical trials got newer drugs that were subsequently proven to be better, and I not, I don't think that history of improvement is done yet. Uh, Beyond clinical trials, there are often access programs that once the clinical trials have shown a new drug is good uh, and sometimes really good, everybody wants it. The company says, fine, we'll give it to you for free while the government is deciding to pay for it. That's really nice, but then if the government takes too long to decide or if they decide not to pay for it, they close and patients who haven't gotten on are out of luck. So what does that leave us with? The third mechanism is a serious negotiation. Uh, it would be great if they came up with novel pricing mechanisms uh, because right now there are very difficult decisions going on across Canada with the regulatory agencies, with the payers, uh, the agency called INES in Quebec. There's a pan-Canadian uh, agency that looks at the same thing. And it's a difficult discussion of how much cost are we willing to pay for saving somebody's life by one year or by five years? And, you know, it's a difficult discussion. It's not one I ever want to have with patients, but it's one that is going on worldwide all the time. So finally, just a couple conclusions. Uh, we've made some great advances, uh, but the great advances lead to higher expectations, and we have to try to meet them. Uh, Targeted therapy, that's TT, and immuno-oncology therapy uh, are dramatic so far, but they still aren't perfect. They're still resistant. Some people are resistant up front, especially to immunotherapy. Uh, some resistance is secondary, i.e. they relapse, especially targeted therapy. And toxicities remain a problem for all these therapies, uh, but especially for the combined uh, immunotherapy I told you about. Clinical trials are great and they're ongoing and there are lots of them and it's a great way to get coverage and not bankrupt, your, you know, to get good drugs without bankrupting your province and maybe you'll get better drugs than you could get on the market. That's been the case. Uh, and just a plug for Canada is a great place for clinical trials. We really have some very well organized and effective clinical trial uh, groups across the country. Uh, but eventually we need to figure out how to pay for all these drugs. And so with that, I will take questions and also see who's been trying to page me for the last 10 minutes. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Um, as always, very informative. Uh, and yes, I guess we have a lot of knowledgeable participants on the line because uh, a lot of their big questions were actually your big questions. 
Uh, so I've had to kind of scribble some out along my uh, notepad here. But there are still a few and uh, I'll go quickly through them. Uh, the first question we had from a patient is, are we done with interferon? The short answer is yes. Um, I was never a big believer in adjuvant interferon, uh, especially the way it was given in North America. Uh, in North America, it was given at a very high dose, which is toxic to everyone, uh, so toxic that a substantial number of patients quit. In fact, the majority of patients quit before the full year of therapy. Uh, and in response to all that toxicity, you got a prolongation of your period of relapse, so your progression-free survival was improved, but the overall survival, the end result for saving lives, was either not different at all or very, very minimally different. And there were a bunch of studies and they were contradictory and people argued for 20 years. Uh, and I think now people have stopped arguing that we have finally drugs that are really effective. And also, I didn't have a chance to talk about this, it looks like they're going to be effective in the adjuvant setting, although so far we only have one study finished. Okay, our second question was, uh, I'm a 3C neck melanoma resected and tried interferon, had heart issues, so stopped. Are any of these new trials coming soon for the stage 3 patient? Yes, there are trials open now. Uh, some of them are, you know, they all have very specific entry criteria and, for example, having had treatment already in that setting would make you ineligible for any of the current trials, I think. Uh, but in general, these are trials either testing the new immunotherapy agents I told you about, the new targeted agents I told you about, or um, in some cases, they randomize the new immunotherapy agents versus interferon. I mean, you know, we want to prove that these new agents are really better than interferon. Uh, for me, I'm not that excited by those trials just because I never liked interferon, and I don't need to prove things are better than interferon. If they prove they're better than placebo, uh, that would be good enough for me. But I think the community as a whole wants to see the versus interferon results. So there, there are a bunch of trials, some of which have control group interferon, some of them have control group placebo. Um, but again, uh, once you've had some interferon, I think you, you, you've done enough for your adjuvant therapy and then you just have to hope all is well and watch closely. And if there is a relapse, uh, you heard about all the things that we have and are going to have available uh, to treat the relapse. Perfect. The next question is, how does one find out about trials that are available in Canada? Is there a listing somewhere or do we depend on our oncologists we are working with to advise us? Can patients go to different parts of the country to seek out appropriate trials? Right. So there are lists. Uh, the best list North America wide, and it's actually almost worldwide now, is at what's called the website called clinicaltrials.gov. It's a US website. It tries to list every clinical trial on earth. Uh, and you can go there and you can see all these different trials and then you can scroll down to find where they are. Some of them in Canada and some of them aren't. If they are in Canada, then it will tell you the location. Uh, it's written more for doctors than for patients, so it's not always that easy to figure out if it's the right trial for you, and that you'd really need uh, to talk to your oncologist. Uh, the other approach is to go to your oncologist and ask, and often the oncologists at the big centers are the ones who really know about clinical trials. Uh, you know, Clinical trials in Canada are really concentrated at the big centers. So that means the Jewish General Hospital or the MUHC or the SHUM or, well, not so much for melanoma, but say for hematology trials, uh, HMR uh, in Montreal. Uh, in Quebec City, there are some very big clinical trial groups. I think the SHUK has a big melanoma group. Uh, PMH in Toronto, Sunnybrook uh, in Toronto, you know, Alberta Cross Cancer Center, Vancouver, um, you know, the big cancer centers across the country um, have the best access to trials and will also know if they don't have a trial there, 
where it is. Uh, the final thing, at least if you're in Montreal, is there are a couple of websites that are Montreal specific. There's JAC, which is Quebec specific, and then we have uh, in our new uh, Rossi Cancer Network, which is this attempt to better integrate and coordinate all cancer care among the McGill hospitals. Uh, we have a website that has the clinical trials that are available at the different hospitals uh, in our network. Uh, so there are lots of sources of information, and I would suggest don't limit yourself to just one source. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Miller. I know we're getting close to the end of the time. Um, so uh, what I would say to participants is, you know, if you have questions even around uh, clinical trials, uh, you can contact us at Save Your Skin. Uh, we don't hold a lot of that information on our website and really only because that information changes so quickly that we always want to make sure when patients are looking for those clinical trials that we're giving them really up-to-date information. So if you do have a question though around clinical trials where they are uh, and you can't find it online or you can't read through some of the documents you do find, please reach out to us and maybe we can help you walk through the process. So I'd like to thank Dr. Miller again and everyone for attending. Just a reminder that this webinar is recorded and will be available on our Save Your Skin uh, website shortly. I just want to say that Save Your Skin prides itself in putting our patients first. So if you have any suggestions for upcoming webinars, we would love to hear from you. Uh, you will receive a survey form uh, at the end of this webinar and we'd really appreciate if you could take a little time to fill it in and let us know what you would like to see in the future. So again, uh, Dr. Miller, I thank you. Thank you as always. Um, excellent presentation and uh, we'll let you uh, go now and save some more lives. Okay, thanks a lot. It was a pleasure.